you know Peter Parker who's Spider-Man? Yes. Is that him? No. 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 Is that him? Yes. Welcome back everyone. This will be my full Spider-Man No Way Home breakdown video Easter eggs for the entire movie how it connects with all the other Marvel Phase 4 movies and what it's setting up. There's a bunch of teasers for future Marvel Phase 4 movies, as well as Spider-Man 4 and the next Spider-Man trilogy too. So if you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. There's still a bunch of things that we have to talk about. Careful for spoilers for the entire movie if you have not seen it yet, but the opening scene of the movie starts during the Spider-Man Far From Home post credit scene. You get the audio of that scene playing over the Marvel Studios logo, the Sony logo, then the first actual frame is Mysterio shouting out Peter Parker's identity as Spider-Man and their immediate reaction before the crowd starts to mob MJ and Spider-Man has to go save her. Love how the dude totally tries to tackle Spider-Man as he's taking off, like he had a chance. Some of you may have also spotted a continuity error during this scene too. So if you look at MJ, she's wearing the same outfit that she was at the end of Spider-Man Far From Home in the post credit scene, but the continuity error is actually the Black Dahlia necklace. So she's not wearing the necklace during the Far From Home post credit scene, but she is wearing it here because they broke it during Spider-Man Far From Home. So it's not quite an eight years later homecoming level error, but it is like a minor continuity error. She wears the Black Dahlia necklace through the entire movie and after the second spell, just to tease that she will eventually remember Spider-Man. Like she won't remember why the necklace is important to her. Like, why am I always wearing this? It's important for some reason. I just can't remember exactly where I got it. You can see them web sling past an ad for the Rogers Captain America musical, which we've seen during the Hawkeye series. This movie, just to explain the timeline, overlaps a little with the events of the Hawkeye episodes. The beginning of the movie takes place right at the end of the summer, 2024, after they come back from their summer vacation trip. But most of the plot takes place around October, around the Halloween holiday. Everything right up to the final battle with the Green Goblin mostly takes place over the course of a couple days, though. There are a couple small time jumps right at the beginning of the film. But once the Sinister Six characters show up, they're only in the MCU, along with Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man, for a little over a day. Like, they're not actually in the MCU for that long. But at the end of the film, after Doctor Strange performs his second spell, there's another time jump and everybody forgets Peter Parker entirely. They pick up months later during the Christmas holiday because you can see it's snowing everywhere, there are Christmas decorations everywhere. And the Hawkeye crossover actually goes a little bit deeper too. At the very end of the movie when they reveal his brand new Spider-Man costume, the bright blue and red comic book accurate costume, and he web slings through Rockefeller Center past the ice rink and the Christmas tree, we're actually going to see one of the big final battles take place on the Hawkeye series with Yelena Belova in the tracksuits there next week in Hawkeye Episode 6. They swing past a Fortnite ad, which will remind you of New Master in Avengers Endgame. There's also a Sony PlayStation ad because Sony owns the Spider-Man rights. So in all the Spider-Man movies, there are ads for all kinds of Sony products. There's a second ad for the Rogers Captain America musical. The ads are all over New York City in the Hawkeye series as well. They can do this all day. When they come out of the subway tunnels, it's right in front of Mr. Delmar's bodega, his newest bodega, because they blew it up during Spider-Man Homecoming. We find out that Happy and Aunt May have just broken up, I think mostly just to pay off their dramatic arc because of what's happening with Aunt May dying at the end of the movie. But this is the same apartment that they were living in during Spider-Man Far From Home. So if you look around his bedroom, you can see the closet where he keeps his original Stark Tech Spider-Man suit, the advanced suit. That's the newer Steve Ditko red and black suit. And in the corner, he's got the case for the Iron Spider nanotech suit plugged in. On the wall, it says don't turn off the lights because if you unplug this, it disables the nanobots. But it's also meant to be an Easter egg for Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, the Spider-Man Broadway play from a couple years ago. So now we have a Spider-Man musical and we have a Captain America musical. The t-shirt that he puts on is the same t-shirt that he wore during Spider-Man Homecoming, I Survived My Trip to New York City. They have a joke about J. Jonah Jameson broadcasting from his house with a green screen like he's some common YouTuber. They show a bunch of artwork and signs people carry depicting Peter as the devil, calling him the devil in disguise. This is just a reference to the Mephisto storyline from Spider-Man One More Day, which inspired some of the story aspects about Doctor Strange's spell in the movie to make people forget that he was Spider-Man. During that storyline, the reason Peter asked Doctor Strange to make everyone forget was to try and bring Aunt May back to life after she was killed. She also dies in this movie. But Doctor Strange flat out turns him down, and Mephisto takes advantage of him, saying that I'll help you perform the spell. 
When they show their lineup, Peter's mugshot number is 071500. That's a reference to Ultimate Spider-Man number 15, which was released in the year 2000. It was a story where someone figures out his secret identity and wants to reveal it to the world, just like Mysterio did in the movie. The artwork of the baby spider crying in diapers on the cover of the Time magazine is done kind of in the style of the spider ham art from Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And we see someone throw green paint on his advanced suit in the street, which is why later in the movie he turns the advanced suit inside out, and that's where the black suit comes from. So if you couldn't tell, the black suit is just the advanced suit reversed inside out. When Charlie Cox's Matt Murdock Daredevil shows up and they start talking about stolen Stark tech, they're talking about the fabricator in the arc reactor that he yoinked. So just to explain the Daredevil of it all, now Charlie Cox's Daredevil from the Netflix series is canon to the MCU. They just reintroduced Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin during the Hawkeye series, so Kingpin is also canon to the MCU now. I've already done a bunch of videos about what their plans are for Daredevil inside the MCU. Eventually, they are going to do a Daredevil Disney Plus series, but we probably won't see that for a couple years. Peter Parker does not know that Matt Murdock is Daredevil. That's why he's surprised when he catches the brick and says, wait a minute, how did you do that? And he says, I'm a very good lawyer. I believe we will also see Charlie Cox show up during the She-Hulk episodes early next year when that series premieres. The agent who arrests Spider-Man is named Cleary. That's a version of comic book Cleary from the Damage Control comic book. Damage Control in the MCU is an agency created by Iron Man in partnership with the U.S. government to help clean up the damage caused by the Avengers battles, superhero battles in general. They've since become a full branch of the U.S. government, like Homeland Security, so that's why they're able to arrest Spider-Man and everyone else. When they're taking all these pictures for their evidence, there's a bunch of Easter eggs and callbacks of Spider-Man Homecoming, Peter's Star Wars toys, he has a picture with Ned Leeds, the Stark Tech glasses that control the drones with the Edith AI. Spider-Man's new t-shirt says the physics are theoretical, but the fun is real because he's always wearing joke t-shirts through the movies. During the interrogation, we learn that Spider-Man still hasn't figured out about Talos and his wife being the scroll versions of Nick Fury and Maria Hill. Real Nick Fury will be back during the Secret Invasion Disney Plus series next year. For those of you with a bunch of scroll theories, the picture they show of Happy on the screen with the huge mullet is actually from Iron Man 3 in the flashback at the beginning of the movie to the 90s. And one of the other funny meta Easter eggs some of you have probably realized is that when they're having the Charlie Cox Daredevil cameo scene is the way he and Happy go back and forth. Because if you don't remember, during the Ben Affleck Daredevil movie, John Favreau played Foggy Nelson. So there's like this weird multiverse Daredevil thing going on between them. We then find out Happy's apartment is on Long Island. He's got all kinds of Stark Tet Easter eggs, Iron Man Easter eggs all over the place. He's got Iron Man's dumb E robot. When they reveal the fabricator from Far From Home, the arc reactor powering it is Iron Man's old Mark VI reactor that he made using the new Infinity Stone element during Iron Man 2. This is also the arc reactor that he was using during the first Avengers movie. When he and MJ are talking on the phone, you notice behind her in her bedroom walls, you can see the drawings that she did of Peter when they were in detention during Homecoming. And the next day at school, when the crowd is waiting for them, Betty Brant uses the trademark Mary Jane catchphrase from the comics, Go Get Em, Tiger! If you follow the Spider-Man No Way Home account on TikTok too, they made her a full-blown Daily Bugle intern for J. Jonah Jameson in-universe, and she runs the Daily Bugle's TikTok account. The crowd shouts all kinds of jokes at them. One of the dudes is a total MJ stan and asks her if she's going to have his spider babies. In the comics, she literally has a baby with Peter Parker who gets his Spider-Man abilities, and they name her May Parker after Aunt May. She's called May Day Parker and becomes a version of Spider-Man when she gets older. Later in the movie, when Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man shows up, he reveals that he's started a family with his MJ, so it's possible that they also have a daughter, May Day Parker style, in his universe. Flash Thompson's book, Flashpoint, is also a clever reference at the DC Comics Flash story, Flashpoint, where he tries to change the past to undo the death of his mother, but it makes everything so much worse. And when Mr. Harrington, Mr. Dell, and Coach Wilson unveil the shrine that they created to Spider-Man, you can see a whole bunch of objects from Spider-Man Homecoming, like his debate team jacket, there's a real-life Spider-Man action figure, legit, like it's just a regular Spider-Man action figure that you can go out on the street and buy. It's of him wearing his classic comic book costume, which we then later see Tom Holland's Spider-Man create at the end of this movie. The way they're playing Coach Wilson, though, is that like he's a full-blown conspiracy nutter who totally believes Mysterio's video. On the rooftop, Steve Ditko's name is written in graffiti in the background. Also, you see Genki's name written here. Ned Leeds in the MCU is kind of a combination of Ned Leeds from the comics and Genki from the Ultimate Spider-Man comics. 
They're all trying to get into MIT because Midtown High is a STEM school, like it feeds into the sciences. Also, his surrogate father in the MCU, Iron Man, went to MIT. MIT is also the place where Iron Man gave his big Civil War presentation on the barf technology. So MIT is just a big MCU location in general. When he starts getting the college acceptance letters, you can see that he started putting together his Lego Death Star again from Spider-Man Homecoming. You also see the Lego Palpatine from Homecoming as well. The dummy robot later knocks it over, destroying it, and later Electro asks him, are these your Legos? In the movie, MJ is working at a diner, just like Kirsten Dunst's MJ was working at a diner during the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies. It's a different diner, but just another subtle reference between their versions of the character. When he goes to the Sanctum, the reason the door opens automatically is because Wong already knows that he's there, like he can sense him outside the door. They explain the reason the Sanctum is covered in snow is just because of the confusion between Wong and Doctor Strange and what their relationship is now post Avengers Endgame and their new duties, because one of the main gateways in the Sanctum connects to Siberia and they didn't block the snow that comes through. Siberia also being where the Hydra Winter Soldier program is located. And they explained that because Doctor Strange was snapped for five years, Wong automatically inherited the title of Sorcerer Supreme, and they didn't take it away from him after Avengers Endgame when Doctor Strange came back. So they're kind of bickering like this old married couple about who's really in charge. Like, uh, technically Wong is in charge, and they kind of play it as a joke throughout the film. Like, whatever happens, don't let Wong find out. Wong also jokes that had Doctor Strange been the one for the past five years who was still around and didn't get snapped, he would have probably burnt the Sanctum to the ground. That's also kind of meant to be one of the setup teasers for the plot of Doctor Strange 2, where we see the consequences of Doctor Strange messing with reality in the multiverse. I'll be doing a separate Doctor Strange 2 trailer video because there is so much stuff going on in that trailer. Just to explain the timeline of this movie too, this is taking place after the events of the Shang-Chi movie, so he's already had his scene fighting with the Abomination in the ring. And I'll talk about this at the end of the video too, because of so many crazy things happening in the MCU all right on top of each other. The events of the Eternals movie is also taking place around the same time the events of Spider-Man No Way Home are taking place. When Doctor Strange shows up, he's wearing a Columbia sweater because that's where he went to college. It's also a subtle Easter egg for the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies because in real life, they use the campus of Columbia in New York City to double as the campus for Empire State where Spider-Man goes to college. And the spell that they use to make people forget, he calls the runes of cough call. They spend a lot of WandaVision sort of setting up the rules for how runes and magic work inside the MCU with Agatha Harkness and Scarlet Witch. Agatha Harkness and Scarlet Witch use them for defensive purposes. Doctor Strange is using them as part of this big memory spell. When Wong claims that the spell travels the dark borders of known and unknown reality, the unknown reality that he's talking about is just the areas of the multiverse that they don't have a lot of knowledge of. The Ten Rings of Power are a good example of that. Like Wong says there's no record of the Ten Rings anywhere in Kamartaj, and they have records that go back to the dawn of the multiverse. Doctor Strange explains that the Sanctum was built on top of ancient runes of a temple where they performed the spell because this area is at the intersection of a bunch of ultra powerful magical ley lines. When he says that they weren't the first ones to try and tap that power with the Sanctums, that's a teaser for something I think that they'll get into with future Doctor Strange movies. The joke about them shooting the episode of The Equalizer here in the 80s is just an action thriller series. If you've ever lived in New York City, they're always filming TV shows and movies all over the place, borrowing people's apartments, people's houses. When Peter messes the spell up, Doctor Strange says he changed it six times. Spider-Man says he only did it five times. That's a reference to the five Sinister Six villains, and the sixth time I think is a reference to Venom in the post credit scene. And at the end of the movie, when the spell gets even worse, when reality starts tearing all over the place, you see those blue figures show up in the cracks of reality from other universes. Most of those characters are other Sinister Six Spider-Man villains. Like there's a Kraven the Hunter with a spear, a classic version of Scorpion, Black Cat, a classic version of the Rhino. One of them even looks kind of like the Watcher, Uwatu from the What If series. Mostly other classic Spider-Man villains though. The MIT admissions officer's license plate is a reference to The Amazing Spider-Man number 3, published in 1963 because it was the first appearance of Dr. Octopus, and when Alfred Molina's Dr. Octopus from Spider-Man 2 shows up, he says, The power of the sun in the palm of my hand, a line directly from Spider-Man 2. He also repeats that line when he sees Iron Man's arc reactor, because the arc reactor itself is very similar to what he was trying to achieve with his fusion reactor. 
The Nissan license plate is another reference to an amazing Spider-Man comic book, Sinister Six team up, foreshadowing the other Sinister Six characters later in the movie. When he steals Spider-Man's Iron Spider nanites, giving himself a temporary Iron Man upgrade, this is a very meta reference to the connection between Tobey Maguire's Dr. Octopus and MCU Iron Man in the first Iron Man movie. Kevin Feige originally wanted to have Iron Man be the person who created Dr. Octopus's arms, like he wanted them to be Stark Tech, but at the time, Sony said no dice. Spider-Man then learns that he can use his AI to take control of Dr. Octopus's arms. There are a lot of octopus jokes throughout the movie, like Spider-Man calls it a tentacle situation, and later Aunt May asks him if he drinks salt water because he's an octopus. When the admissions officer says she's going to help them all get into MIT, at the end of the movie after the second Doctor Strange spell, that's why both MJ and Ned Leeds get into MIT, but Peter doesn't because the second spell made her forget about Peter, so she and MIT never thought to include him for admission. Green Goblin then shows up in his full goblin armor from the first Spider-Man movie because they were all transported before they died, so presumably he was transported before his final battle with Tobey Maguire, and that's why his costume looks all shiny. He gives Spider-Man's Iron Spider gauntlet an upgrade, giving it the magic spell to instantly transport the villains into the holding cells. There are all kinds of jokes about Ned Leeds secretly having magical abilities, but when Doctor Strange jokes at the beginning of the film saying that he should consult his physician about the tingling in his hands, that's just a joke about Ned maybe having early onset diabetes. But legit during the movie, they do clarify Ned Lees does have some magical aptitude because later in the movie, Doctor Strange confirms, did you open these portals? And he says yes, and then it gives him a nod like, oh, yeah, it's pretty cool. They also give him the cloak of levitation briefly later when it saves him from falling, and he says, thank you, Mr. Cape. Just teasing that, yes, Ned could become a sorcerer someday. Doctor Strange makes his Scooby-Doo reference. Go ahead and Scooby-Doo this crap. When they start talking about the Undercroft, the Undercroft is actually a real-world term for the crypt of a church. Later, Spider-Man also tells them that the crypt is where the cells are. Like I said, Doctor Strange explained the Sanctum was built on top of an ancient temple that's far older, and the crypt of the Undercroft is just part of the original temple. But the joke in present day is that in the Sanctum, they're just using the Undercroft as their regular basement, like they're doing their laundry there when they first walk down. There's a bunch of old board games. The goatee template is just a joke about Doctor Strange's goatee. There's a Pilates machine that Ned thinks is a torture rack. There's a whole model train set. Just a whole lot of common, regular household items. Like, all their Christmas decorations are up above them. MJ makes a whole bunch of Doctor Strange jokes. She calls him Doctor Magic, then later also tells the Sinister Six villains that they're in the dungeon of a wizard. Electro also calls him Dungeons and Dragons. Ned thinks that the lizard is a dinosaur. There's a really quick blink and you'll miss it horror movie easter egg when Spider-Man starts trying to clean his advanced suit with all the cleaning fluid. When he reaches for the solution, behind him there's this old creepy doll that turns its head and looks at him. Like the doll is supposed to be alive or possessed. There's a couple easter eggs for things in real life on MJ's phone when they start looking for the Green Goblin. This person on the glider is actually a real person who created his own Green Goblin style glider with a massive drone. Then later there's another Green Goblin joke when she pulls up the next picture in its Green Elf cosplay because Spider-Man earlier had told Doctor Strange that the other villain he saw looked kind of like a flying Green Elf. Zoom and enhance on Ned Lee's laptop, he's got a this is fine meme, which is sort of commentary on the plot of the movie too, like everything is on fire, this is all terrible, but it's totally fine, everything is fine. When he starts reading the eyewitness report saying people spotted Green Goblin at a military facility attacking, that's a reference to the way they introduced Green Goblin during the first Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie. One of his first acts wearing the goblin armor was to attack the military base. Then they bring back Thomas Hayden Church's Sandman from Spider-Man 3 and Electro from Amazing Spider-Man 2. Peter says a blue guy showed up. Jamie Foxx was telling jokes when he was first cast in the movie saying, I'm not going to be blue in this one. There are many, many jokes and references to those classic Spider-Man movies throughout the film. The way they explain his yellow lightning in the MCU, though, is that Electro basically says, oh, I felt something was different about the energy of this universe. I like it. Later, when he rigs up the arc reactor with his harness costume, it's meant to resemble the original Electro comic book costume. They even do the electric crown around his head using his energy. When all the Sinister Six villains come back into the cells, they start recapping the plots of their original movies, joking about how the lizard tried to turn everyone into lizards. He offers to turn Electro into a lizard. When Ned Leeds asks if the tree is a scientist who got turned into a tree or a tree monster of some kind, that's just a Groot reference because he is a talking tree. 
then the way they play Norman Osborn Green Goblin between the different personas is that for most of this part of the movie, he's Norman Osborn. He smashes the helmet, which also kind of sets up him having the more comic book accurate costume later in the film. He tries to go back to his house from the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies. We find out that there is no Oscorp in existence in the MCU. He also implies that Harry Osborn is different in the MCU because he kind of halfway finishes a sentence when talking about his son. Then for those of you that have been waiting for more X-Men Easter eggs in these new Marvel Phase 4 movies, there's a classic X-Men symbol in green paint over Spider-Man's face on the Fee Shelter billboard when he's coming back to see Norman Osborn. The Fee Shelters themselves are right out of the comics. FEAST is an acronym that stands for Food, Emergency Aid, Shelter, and Training. But they were created by Mr. Negative in the comics, so maybe they'll introduce a version of him in Spider-Man 4 or some future Spider-Man movie. Norman Osborn corrects Spider-Man that it's Dr. Osborn, not Mr., and he confuses MJ for the Toby version of Mary Jane because of Harry Osborn's relationship with MJ. That's how he got to know her. The Goblin persona doesn't really take over again until they go back to Happy's apartment. When Doctor Strange brings his box back to contain the spell, the symbol on it is the symbol of the Vishanti. It's the same symbol on the Eye of Agamotto and the same symbol in the window of the Sanctum. The Vishanti in the comics are a trio of cosmic beings that grant Doctor Strange the magical energy that he uses to weave his spells. Then for those of you asking how Spider-Man is able to keep the box away from him even after he gets separated into his astral form, this is all because of the way the Spidey sense works. It's all about the Peter Tingle. But the Spidey sense is actually like this sixth sense biological ability that Spider-Man has, and it just allows him to innately to automatically react to threats. So after Doctor Strange separates him into his astral form, just like the Ancient One did to him and then to the Hulk during Avengers Endgame, his body is automatically reacting to the threat of Doctor Strange. When he gets the Cloak of Levitation, that's an Easter egg for What If Spider-Man from the Marvel Zombies episode. The whole Mirror Dimension fight is just a much larger version of the Mirror Dimension fight from the first Doctor Strange movie. They have a couple references to Spider-Man 2 with the train fight scene when he and Doctor Strange fight on the subway train that splits into many different aspects. Then they have another sort of Spider-Man science bros joke when he defeats Doctor Strange's magic using science defeating him using basic geometry. And then during the end credits with all the graphics, like the hand-drawn graphics, they have a bunch of geometric shapes as a callback to that. When he returns and offers to help the Sinister Six, Green Goblin says his iconic phrase from the first Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie, I'm something of a scientist myself. When Electro starts flipping the TV channels in Happy's apartment using his powers, the first image is of the new Statue of Liberty with Captain America's shield foreshadowing the final boss fight. When Dr. Octopus says Spider-Man is helping them using scraps from a bachelor's junk drawer, that's a big callback to the iconic Iron Man line, Tony Stark built this in a cave with a box of scraps. They start trying to fabricate fixes for all of the villains, starting with the chip that helps control Dr. Octopus's arms, but the Goblin anti-serum doesn't work until Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man tunes it just a little bit. Electro and Sandman bond over their villain origin stories like they both fell into things. Gotta be careful where you fall. When he fixes Dr. Octopus, the lights on his tentacle arms change back to white to show you that he's in control because during Spider-Man 2, the lights were always red when the tentacles were in control. He gives Spider-Man back his Iron Spider nanites and they combine with the advanced suit to create the new integrated suit. That's just what they're calling this version of the suit. Green Goblin kills Aunt May and then as she starts to die, they kind of turn her into a version of MCU Uncle Ben, giving her the great power, great responsibility speech. And this is the first time that it's ever been uttered out loud in the MCU. Green Goblin's costume turns into a more comic book accurate version of his costume. He's got the purple cloak. He later gets the pouch and the strap from the comics as well. Then they finally bring back Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire when Ned Leeds learns that he can open portals using the sling ring. Each of them is wearing the same versions of their Spider-Man costumes that we last saw them in, but Andrew admits that after Gwen Stacy died, he got super rageful and bitter, more violent, more hardcore. And Toby explains that now he has a family with his MJ. Like I said, maybe if they come back in another multiverse movie like Secret Wars, they'll have a Mayday Parker reference. Also, when they're bringing each of them back, like when they step through the portals, they start playing the theme songs from their Spider-Man movies. Later in the movie, Michael Giacchino remixed all three of the Spider-Man theme songs into a new theme song when they're doing their full Science Bros scene. They also have a version of this later during the final boss fight when they're all web slinging together at the same time on screen. When they all meet, they reference losing Uncle Ben. Toby says the rest of the line, with great power comes great responsibility. 
Andrew explains what happened to his Gwen Stacy during Amazing Spider-Man 2 to set up the scene of him saving MJ from falling later, redeeming himself. Tobey Maguire tells them about killing the man who killed Uncle Ben, which sets up the end of the movie where he stops Tom Holland's Spider-Man from killing Green Goblin. And then they go full team Spider-Man science bros because all three of them are scientists. There's a funny Easter egg for James Franco's Harry Osborn and Hobgoblin when Ned Leeds asked Toby if he had a best friend and he basically explains the plot of Spider-Man 3 with the Harry Osborn Goblin. Later Ned tells Peter, I'll never turn into a supervillain and try to kill you because that's exactly what happened in the comics. Ned Leeds becomes a version of Hobgoblin and tries to kill Spider-Man. When he leaves the message for the world with J. Jonah Jameson, he calls himself a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Andrew Garfield also called himself that too. The whole thing with the new Statue of Liberty and the Captain America shield is you have to remember this is all happening after Falcon has become the new Captain America during Falcon and Winter Soldier. So they're celebrating Steve Rogers Captain America's legacy, what the Avengers did saving the universe in Avengers Endgame and the passing of the mantle with the shield to Falcon. They just referenced it during the Hawkeye series, Yelena Belova telling Kate Bishop that she wanted to go visit the new Statue of Liberty because of the time jump to Christmas at the end of the movie. By that time, they finished construction. They make a whole bunch of jokes about Tobey Maguire's organic web shooters. Like, does it only come out of your wrists or does it come out of other places as well? When he starts talking about his web block, that's the existential crisis that he had during Spider-Man 2 when he couldn't use his abilities. They reference all the craziest villains that they faced and Tom Holland's Spider-Man tells them about the plot of Avengers Infinity War, Thanos, the Infinity Gauntlet, and Avengers Endgame. They also joke that the Avengers is a band. Like, is it a band? Because the Avengers don't exist in their universes. Tobey Maguire references Venom, also kind of foreshadowing the Venom post credit scene because he says, oh, I fought an alien too. He was a lump of black goo. All the scenes of all three of them together fighting, all the witty banter, it's all amazing. This is probably one of my favorite parts of the movie. They confirm my lizard trailer edit theory, the mystery lizard scene of him getting kicked by nothing but air. Dr. Octopus returns to help them, which is a similar twist to the end of Spider-Man 2 where he turned good again and helped save the world. When Ned Leeds accidentally opens the portal for Dr. Strange, he says he's been dangling over the Grand Canyon for 12 hours. That's a callback to the Loki joke from Thor Ragnarok, him falling for 30 minutes. When Electro chills out, talking to Andrew Garfield, there's a huge Miles Morales Easter egg. He says, I always thought that you were black and this is, well, maybe there's a black Spider-Man out there somewhere. They haven't completely revealed all their plans for MCU Miles Morales, but he does exist. They name drop him during Spider-Man Homecoming. Tobey Maguire reunites with Dr. Octopus saying that he's been trying to do better because that's something that Dr. Octopus told to him during Spider-Man 2. Andrew Garfield saves MJ, redeeming himself for not saving Gwen Stacy. And then when Spider-Man is fighting Green Goblin on top of the giant Captain America shield, it's meant to be a callback to his MCU introduction during Captain America Civil War with that iconic Captain America shield scene. They pay off that Tobey Maguire scene by having him stop Spider-Man from killing Green Goblin. And then, like I said, the multiverse villains start showing up in the cracks of reality, all mostly meant to be other Spider-Man villains from other universes like classic Kraven, Rhino, Black Cat, Scorpion. They fix Green Goblin, then perform the spell, sending everyone back and making everyone forget that he's Spider-Man in the MCU. But I know there are a lot of questions about what exactly this changes. So it does not erase everything that Spider-Man has done because right after this, you hear J. Jonah Jameson yelling about Spider-Man. It only erases knowledge of Peter Parker. The spell also erases all the personal relationships that Peter formed as Peter Parker, but not the relationships that he formed when he was wearing the costume and the mask. And that's also the reason why he's got the GED course book at the end of the film, because Peter Parker was enrolled at Midtown High. So by erasing knowledge of him, it means like he was never enrolled there in the first place. But when it's time for Avengers 5 and they want to have another big Spider-Man crossover, he can go re-explain everything to them again. Like if he told Doctor Strange what happened with the spell, Doctor Strange would probably get up to speed pretty quickly. Like, oh, okay, I get it. MJ's joke about figuring out that he's Spider-Man all over again is just foreshadowing, I think for the next Spider-Man trilogy to them doing something similar that they did during this first trilogy. She says she figured out his identity before she can do it again. That's kind of what happened during Spider-Man Far From Home. The whole ending scene at Aunt May's grave is very similar to the way they ended a couple of the Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movies. A lot of them had scenes at the ends of their movies at various points in graveyards. Happy also references Iron Man's death in Avengers Endgame saying something like this happened with a friend of mine a little while ago. 
We learn that he's moved into a tiny dump of an apartment that looks very similar to the apartment that Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man lived in. Too bad they didn't bring Mr. Dickovich back. He still needs that rent. There's a new coffee cup, meaning that he's continued to go back to MJ's diner after the time jump. Like, it's a couple months time jump. They go from October to Christmas week during December. You see that he's been using a sewing machine to make his own costume using scraps from the old costume and new bright blue fabric to make it look more like the classic comic book costume. The sewing machine is also a callback to Spider-Man making his own costume in the comics and Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield's versions both making their Spider-Man costumes using sewing machines. Like I said, they're just taking him back to ground level, being more of a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, much less tech-driven, much less beholden to Iron Man, other big Avengers characters. Then he swings over Rockefeller Center, the ice rink, the Christmas tree during Christmas week, like I said, which overlaps with the plot of the Hawkeye series. I've already done a big post credit scene video for Venom, so I'll link that at the end of this, and I'll be doing a new Doctor Strange 2 trailer video tomorrow, so make sure you have alerts turned on for my channel so you don't miss that. Just to explain the timeline of the Eternals movie too, because there's like a giant stone Eternal, Tiamat, in the Indian Ocean right now, that's happening around the time Spider-Man No Way Home is happening. So on the other side of the planet, you just have to picture there's like a giant stone celestial that just came out of the ocean, just as Spider-Man is fixing everything with the second spell. If there are any other Easter eggs that you spotted in the movie that I didn't mention in this video or my previous videos, just write them below in the comments. Everyone click here for that Spider-Man No Way Home post credit scene and click here for the Doctor Strange 2 trailer. I'll update the link as soon as I finish posting that video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.